Uh, we're going to be this, this morning, we're going to be in Romans chapter 5. And so go ahead and open your Bibles there, Romans chapter 5. We are in a, a series of lessons dealing with the, the simple subject of salvation. Uh, and uh, in many ways, it is a very simple subject. Uh, God did not make it complicated with regards to how to come to the Lord. That's by intent. And uh, I think that we should appreciate that. However, because mankind can't keep their nitty grits off of things, and we're constantly wanting to mess with stuff and turn it upside down and complicate it, etc., we find that con the salvation, that particular subject, has become quite complicated. And it's only because we've muddied the water. It's only because we are trying to make assumptions about this and assumptions about that. It's a lot like Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23, where uh, the folks call out at the last day, uh, you know, God, did we not do this and that and the other? And God says, yeah, but you, you missed the simple stuff, basically. I'm really paraphrasing the passage. But he says in verse 21, he says, the will of the Father, that's what I ask you to do. You had one job, do the will of the Father. I didn't ask you to complicate it with all kinds of, of uh, com, uh, you know, uh, controversies like baby baptism and, and once saved, always saved and saying the sinner's prayer. And what about the thief on the cross who, by the way, died long before the church age began? You know, why do we have to complicate things? Why can't we just take the Father's word for it? So when you look at the subject matter of salvation, really and truly, if an individual, I believe this to be true, if an individual is given the word of God, provided with a Bible, and then they are left alone, you leave them alone in a cave somewhere for the next 30 years, uh, as long as they can survive and eat and that kind of thing, and they got the Bible, I believe they'll find God. I, I, and I don't believe that they need me. I don't think that they need you. I think that they will have the message in the sense that they will have received the word of God via, via it was a gift by a preacher or whoever, whoever it was. I am convinced that God made it simple enough that you can study on your own without the, the Catholic hierarchy, without uh, the, the hierarchy of the denominational world. You can study on your own and you can come to an understanding of what God wants from you. Now, it, it may be true. It is obviously true. The scripture teaches this, that in order for us to reach true maturity, to continue to grow, it's important for us to have good people around about us. We need, to, we need to have good instructors and teachers and those kind of things. But as far as finding the will of God itself, I believe that if you've got the Bible, the Word of God, and you've got enough desire to dig, that you can go into the Word and you can find what He wants of you to be done. This morning what I want to do is I want to unravel another one of those complications that man has used to, to mess up the plan of salvation, to get in the way of the Savior. As you go to Romans chapter 5, one of the most favorite passages of the Reformers, the individuals that uh, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, others of those, those individuals, they, they were trying to tweak the church back to a position that they were comfortable with. They weren't ever, Luther never had the desire to go back to the Bible. That was never in his, his, when he puts the 95 theses on the church building door, that was not his intent. And certainly Calvin never had the desire to go back to the Bible. What they wanted to do is they wanted to tweak what they presently had and make it where they felt comfortable with it. You see, they start with what I want and make God's word fit it, which is just upside down. We need to start with whatever God wants and make our lives fit it. Well, Romans chapter 5 is one of those passages that they have taken, and they have complicated it in so many ways. As I told you, this particular series will be divided into four segments. The first is why we need it. Last week, as we began our series, I gave you one of the reasons we don't need it. We do need salvation, but we don't need salvation because you're born in sin. That's a false doctrine. You don't need salvation because it's impossible for you to choose right. That's a false doctrine. And you don't need salvation because God pre-planned it so that you would be a sinner. That's a false doctrine as well. You do need salvation, but you don't need it for those three reasons. Well, I want to expand on this whole idea of you being born with sin, because we kind of touched on that last week and didn't really develop it as far as we need to. But it's, it's a prominent doctrine within those groups that call themselves Christians today. In fact, I would say... With regards to those who claim the 
the title of Christian, I would say that the majority of those individuals believe that you are born a sinner. Now, they won't appreciate this phraseology, but they essentially believe that you are born an evil baby. It has to be that way. If you're born a sinner, sin is evil, then you're born an evil baby. Now, they don't like that phraseology because it just sounds too harsh, but that's exactly what they believe. And last time, you might recall, we went to Psalm 51 and other places, and we, we talked about those passages that they like to twist and take out of context and, and make it sound as if we are born evil babies. But once they lose that argument, they immediately are going to take you to Romans chapter 5. Because in Romans chapter 5, it sounds as if you and I, again, are all tainted by sin because of Adam. And what I'd like to do is I want to read verses... Well, let's, let's, I'm going to start all the way back up at verse 12, and I want to come all the way down to verse 18, because that's the bulk of the context that they're going to misuse. And I want to draw three points with regards to why you, you don't need salvation because you are born under the curse of Adam. That's not one of the reasons for you needing salvation, because that's a false doctrine. That's what I want to deal with this morning. Verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. So you see where they go. Adam sinned. It spreads to everybody. Everybody's a sinner. You get tainted with sin in the womb, and therefore you're a sinner coming out the womb. That's the conclusion that they would draw from verse 12. Now, I want to encourage you to continue to read the inter intervening context, but I want you to skip on down now, if you will, to verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 18, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. I would like for you to see that in this context, it sounds as if, because we have grown up in a world given over to these thoughts, I'm not sure that you would have drawn this, these conclusions had it not been for the Reformers, but because we, it seems to be a popular doctrine that's put forth in the movies and popular books and that kind of thing, it sounds as if Romans chapter 5 is saying, Adam sinned, and because of Adam's sin, it passes that sin on to Cain, who passed his sin on to his child, and on and on until it comes to you. And now you are born in sin. You're tainted by sin from the get-go. Now, again, as I've said already twice, remember, trick question, baby born, three days old, is that baby saved or lost? Trick question, the baby is neither saved nor lost because a baby has nothing to be saved from. A baby is pure, innocent, doesn't even know how to sin. Thus, a baby can't be lost either because it never sinned. So what's a baby? A baby is just simply sincerely of God, pure, innocent of God. We do not bring children into the world as evil babies. David himself, the same guy who they will abuse, and his words with the idea of being born into I was conceived in sin, born into a context of sin is what he's saying. Not that he was born a sinner, but that same guy is going to write that he also was knit together in his mother's womb by God. God doesn't make junk. God doesn't make evil. God doesn't knit us together as evil babies. That baby is pure, sinless, innocent. But when you come to this context, they will again, now let's go back to verse 12. I'll give you three quick points. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sin. They will say, see there, death is spread because all men sinned. But I want you to notice that last phrase. It's in very, very important to understand the last phrase in order for you to understand how death spreads. God gave us the equation. We got a pandemic and this pandemic is spreading across the globe by one medium. And he says what that medium is. The way it spreads is when we sin. Notice the last phrase. It spread to all men because all sinned. Death does not spread until you sin. 
It is our choice, our free will choices, as I ended last week's sermon, it's our free will choices that get us into a position of being isolated from God. Thus, until a baby has the ability to choose right and wrong, it is impossible for a baby to sin. If it's impossible for a baby to sin or miss the mark, then it's impossible for a baby to, in this particular case, to be part of this spreading, if you will. We, I, I hate to use COVID as an example because I, I feel like that in many ways that was such a, an abused time. But let's go ahead because it's fresh in our minds. If you and I know that another individual has COVID, and we intentionally go into that other individual without protective gear on our face, whatever it may be, et cetera, et cetera. We expose ourselves to COVID. We intentionally allow the COVID to come to us. Then we are causing the spread when we take it to somebody else. Same thing is true with sin. You don't spread sin or death in this particular case, unless you sin. That's the, that's the vehicle. A baby cannot do that. Therefore, a baby cannot pass along death. But that leads me to point number two. Because if you'll notice in verse 17, I had you skip on down there. You'll notice that in verse 17, he says, for it is because of one man's trespass that, trespass that death reigned through that one man. And the next thing that they're going to say to you, okay, then, Sonny, how come babies die? Which is a legitimate question. Until you understand the context. Babies die because we're dealing with the physical realm when you talk about death with regards to a baby, not the spiritual realm. This context is not dealing with the physical body. Now, I'm not suggesting that spiritual problems don't impact the body. I am saying that. Nor am I suggesting that they died, were subject to death before they sinned. That is true. I believe Adam and Eve would have lived forever. In the garden paradise, had they not sinned. I believe that. So yes, your sin, spiritually speaking, will impact your physical existence. But we must understand that in this particular context, he is talking about the spiritual death, not the physical death. One of the ways I can prove that to you is this. And it's just simple logic, but I want you to consider this. Why do babies die? Why did Jesus age? Perhaps you thought of that. Why did Jesus go through puberty? Why did Jesus suffer when he fell down or got tired or just simply had a, a moment of, of discouragement? Why did those things happen? Was it because Jesus was a bad person? Was it because he inherited sin from Adam? No. Those are all physical things that took place because he was born into, just like David, he was born into a context of sin. The world hurts. The world is painful. But he, though born into this context of sin, did not himself sin. Now, they will want to twist that and they'll say, well, the reason Jesus didn't sin is because he was not born of man. He was only born of a woman. Is that true? Well, clearly he was impregnated by God himself. The Holy Spirit impregnates her. I get all of those things. But I'll ask you this. How can Jesus be our perfect high priest, tempted at all points, just as we are, yet without sin? How can he be our perfect high priest if he was born into a context of sin without the potential of sinning? Now, this is going to stretch you just a little bit, but Jesus had to be able to sin. That had to be a potential in order for there to be any true temptation given to him, such as what Satan offered right after his baptism. He had to have the potential of giving in. It had to be there. I'll go to another one. How about the garden as just before his crucifixion? What does Jesus say as he kneels there? Sweats as it were drops of blood. Not my will, but thine be done. Question. Going to stretch you a little bit, but I want you to think about this. Was it possible in that situation for Jesus to have a will different than his father's? 
He says, not my will, but thine be done. How can that be? Because he was talking about a physical will, not a spiritual will. Physically speaking, Father, I don't want to suffer this way. Physically speaking, I don't want to go to the cross. Not my will. Physically speaking, yours be done. In that moment, Jesus made a choice. And he chose that which is spiritual. Spiritually speaking, he and God have always been unified. But physically speaking, there was a separation. We know that from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now hold it. So you're saying the part of God was forsaken by another part of God? Yes. Physically speaking, Jesus had been forsaken. And even to some degree, you have to conclude spiritually speaking, because he is taking upon himself the penalty of our sins. But without going down that trail too far and complicating issues, I want to draw you back to what their deal is here with the, with the baby. So a baby dies. That shows you then that a baby has to have sin because it says right here that death passes to all men because of sin. No, babies die, physically speaking, because even Jesus aged, but Jesus wasn't tainted by sin. Babies die, physically speaking, but babies do not die, spiritually speaking. A child that dies in the womb goes straight to the arms of God. And if you'll speak with these people, they have, they've concocted all kinds of weird concepts with regards to how a baby gets saved in the womb, even though tainted by the sin of Adam, as they assume. I've heard them say, well, we just have to trust that that baby had faith in the womb. Most of you know that babies are baptized, many of them. If you want to call it baptism, it's just more of a pouring of water on the head. But babies are said to be baptized shortly after birth. Largely because of this very idea. We got we to gotta get, get rid of that, that taint, if you will. It's such a perverse concept that is so complicated, the, the, the topic of salvation, that we now have even assumed that babies are evil. You see the dangerous path we take when we begin to travel down the pathway of the doctrines of men. Babies die physically. They do not die spiritually. Spiritually, they are pure, they are innocent, they are of God, and they will go straight to be with God should they die in the womb. Number three, and I'll end. The last thing that I think is hugely important for you to see is the way that they abuse this passage by running to one extreme without embracing the opposite extreme. Watch verse 18. Therefore, that means let's conclude this matter. Let's wrap this up. Let me draw some applications. Therefore, as one tras trespass led to condemnation of all men, that's Adam. All men are condemned because of Adam. As one trespass led to the condemnation of all men, so one act of righteousness leads to the justification in life for all men. Whatever you do with Adam, you got to do with Jesus. Because Jesus came to solve the Adam problem. The passage clearly says that because of Adam, all men sinned. But it also says that because of Jesus, all men are righteous. Question, are all men righteous? Have you ever met an unrighteous man? I certainly have. But the passage says all men are made righteous. If I'm going to draw the extreme conclusion that because of Adam, everybody's a sinner, then I've got to draw the extreme conclusion that because of Jesus, everybody's saved. And you know that's not true. So what could this passage possibly be saying? Again, this is a use of hyperbole. He's talking not just in, in hyperbolic sense, but he's also talking about the generality of the, the thrust of mankind. Because Adam and Eve gave into the temptation initially and unleashed the temptation upon the rest of the world, by far the majority of us from the beginning of time have succumbed and we have become sinners. 
You, you might even say all men have sinned. But I can prove in one statement that all men haven't sinned. Jesus didn't sin. And God defines him as a man, Philippians chapter 2. So clearly this passage is not saying in totality, everybody who's ever existed has, has sinned. So may I continue with my thoughts about the baby? I think there's been millions of babies that have been born and died shortly thereafter in the course of humanity that never sinned. And they're not part of this list. But the bigger part, I think, for understanding verse 18 is this. Whatever you say about Adam, you got to say about Jesus. We know all men are not righteous. So the passage is talking about the potential. The overwhelming potential of Adam's influence on the world is that you're going to sin. But the overwhelming potential of Jesus upon the world is that if you know him, you're going to be righteous. Now, I don't know if I, I'm watching your expressions, and it seems like maybe I've muddied the water a little bit there. And I, if I have, I, I really hate that because I really want this, this particular lesson to, to come home for us. For us to understand, number one, that death passes on to all people when they choose to sin. The death that is being talked about in the context, number two, is spiritual death, not physical death. And then number three, whatever you do to Adam, you got to do to Jesus. And if all men are sinners in Adam, then all men are righteous in Jesus. We know all men are not righteous unless they're in Jesus. And therefore, all men are not sinners unless they choose to be in Adam. It depends on our choice, what we will make of it. And so my second lesson in the series with regards to why we need it is actually part two of why we don't need it. You don't need salvation because you're born a sinner. You don't need salvation because Adam, 6,000 plus years ago, sinned in the garden. You need salvation because you give in to the context that Adam brought upon the world, I'll admit that much, but you do, you need salvation because you give into it, not because God forces you into it. I end with this idea, and again, it's, it's somewhat offensive to the reformers, but nonetheless true. If God forces a baby to be a sinner without sinning, there is no justice. If God forces a baby to be a sinner without sinning, the baby is little more than a puppet. And God is filling his gloried realm with puppets so that one day, when we all gather around his throne, he can manipulate us into worship. The problem with that is, without sincerity, there is no possibility of worship. Sincerity demands personal investment. Without free will, it is impossible to worship. A loyal Calvinist cannot worship. They just simply cannot because they do not believe that they themselves are offering anything in the process. God made them do these things. And yet Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says that worship demands a sacrifice. You cannot sacrifice something that is not your own. That's not your sac. You, you can sacrifice it, but it's somebody else's. You, you can only sacrifice that which you own. Thus, again, I come back to the free will choice. You sin because you choose it, not because God designed you that way.